Welcome to the Dapper Community Call uh, on March 9th. Um, hope everybody's doing well. Hope you had a chance to kind of uh, celebrate the release of version 1.0 as we discussed last time. It was a really exciting milestone. And today we're actually going to talk a little bit about what's going, uh, what's coming next. And uh, Archer is going to start with going through a recent hotfix uh, that we released, uh, version 1.0.1. And then we're going to go over a little bit of the planning that we got towards version 1.1 and also in the kind of six months horizon. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about also how you can influence some of this planning and, and bring things to uh, the front uh, as the community. We really want that feedback and to, to, to continue having Dapper be a community driven project. Uh, as part of that, Charlie's gonna actually propose something that uh, he's looking for uh, some discussion and and uh, um, and to get feedback and and hopefully votes to to see if we can prioritize. And finally, uh, I hope we have enough time after all this good discussion for a demo by our own of uh, Kubernetes events uh, consumption in Dapper. And I'm really hoping we also have some time to uh, discuss anything else that any of you want to. Uh, to talk about. So without further ado, we have a lot of packed agenda. I'll stop sharing and Archer, take it away. Okay, let me share my screen now. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go briefly uh, on this um, hotfix uh, that we identified. Uh, it was based on the issue created by the community. Um, so there was, uh, we identify a risk condition, um, updating actual reminders. So every time you register or unregister an actual reminder, uh, there was a chance of a risk condition. Uh, it did not happen for triggering the reminder. Uh, it was only for registering and unregistering. And as a consequence of that fix, uh, we identified that um, e tag will be required to use accurate state stores going forward. And the only transactional state store that did not have e tag was MongoDB. So we added support for e tag on MongoDB state store as well. And it's 100% backwards compatible. Uh, you, your existing data will automatically get e tag going forward for actors. Um, uh, so for at least, at least for actor reminders. So you don't need to do anything. Um, so, uh, so how does this issue uh, 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 happen? Uh, so let's let me uh, do show a quick PowerPoint. So the original issue was identified as a DAPRD instances trying to update the list of reminders of a given actors in parallel. Um, so the user would create many actors and register one reminder for each actor in parallel, and then it would unregister and then shut down the app. And then when it, the app came back with the DAPRD instance, some reminders would simply quote, quote, be revived and, and start to trigger again, even though they were all unregistered. And the reason why is because uh, reminders are persistent and they outlive the, uh, the actor ID activation. So that the reminders would actually trigger the activation of, of actors. So there is, a, there is a record in the database that is shared across all actors of a given actor type. Um, and that lists all the reminders. So every actor ID rem and, and reminder combination is in a list. Um, and this list is updated by DAPRD. And there was no check at all on concurrency check. So multi updates could happen in parallel. And so basically one, one update would have an older version of uh, the reminder list, add or remove an item, and then override the with the previous version because another update happened in parallel while it was last read. So it's a classic case of get, modify, and set. Uh, doing all that in parallel can lead to risk conditions. Uh, but it cannot be fixed by simple lock in memory because guess what? The same thing can happen in parallel. You can have multiple DAPRD instances and all of them can have the same, the same problem. So you cannot simply have a lock in memory. 
Um, so that's where you can guess the e tag came in, where now we only write uh, to the state store if the e tag matches. So if the e tag for the last time I read changes to y, the, the update will fail and then we just retry. So the update operation, it's retry with an exp exponential back off uh, to deal with the risk condition. So that is a high level of the fix. Uh, it's 100% backwards compatible. Uh, you, can, you don't need to uh, change anything in your database, um, or even your code uh, to update to 101. Uh, and it's highly recommended to use this if you're using reminders for actors. Uh, if you don't, you don't need to rush to update, but if you are, it's recommended, okay? Highly recommended. So, um, uh, so as a change, we change how the state store is laid out where now transactional is not enough to support actors. Uh, it has to be transactional and have e-tag. So it didn't change the support list. Everything that was supported before for actors remains supported. The only difference is MongoDB now has e-tag, okay? So that is a change. That was a hot fix. And uh, if you have any more questions, uh, reach out to us in Discord or uh, through an issue, okay? Thank you very much. Stop sharing. Great, thank you, Arthur. I forgot to mention that um, people can always uh, drop questions in the chat. I'm not seeing any questions on this, but feel free to drop them if we don't get to them now, we'll try to get to them in the end as well. Um, moving on, Archer, maybe you can also lead this one, uh, just going through the version 1.1 1 .1, uh, planning that we got in place and maybe also describing a little bit of, of how people can get trans uh, visibility to that um, and how we're kind of managing that. Sure, uh, let me share my screen again. I'm assuming you guys can see that one more time. Yeah, we see it. Uh, so, now when you open uh, our issue list in Dapper Dapper, and, and we do this in Dapper Dapper because that's a, a centralized place for us to track issues, uh, um, uh, almost like a landing project, if you think about it. Uh, so we go to a six month plan, and then as we plan 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, um, we wanted to know exactly what we're building. We don't want to do like ad hoc stuff on every on every release. Uh, so there's a list here of improvements. Uh, most of them have an issue. Uh, there, I would say half of them have an issue. Uh, some of them uh, we still work on, on creating an issue or find an existing issue. And uh, some of the uh, data that we're going to use uh, uh, to decide on that is community feedback. So. We would like the community to go into particular issues that you feel more uh, passionate or more in need for your project and simply vote up. So you can open an issue here, like this one. And oh, I really want this. There you go, you can do a thumbs up here. We have 16 already. Um, it's not deterministic. So simply having the thumbs, uh, the highest thumbs up does not mean necessarily that it's going to be the first one or the next. Um, but it is a good data point for us to make decisions as maintainers. So please uh, voice your 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 preferences uh, in our planning, and we're going to do more of that going forward, where we request community feedback uh, uh, um, through voting. Uh, we already have a lot of engagement in comments. Um, so some people create an issue, they're passionate about it, and then go and, and they make that point. Um, we also would like to make sure that we can also have some, some more like uh, data on it. Yeah, just to jump on this, uh, sorry, Archard, for uh, jumping in. But one, one thing we, we want to make sure is that, um, first of all, you should know that uh, these issues, most of them, I think, uh, came up as issues just opened by users and by the community. Uh, but at the end of the day, the maintainers of each repo kind of had the discretion of, of the prioritization and, and uh, what's going into the releases. But um, one of the signals that maintainers are going to look for um, are those votes and those engagements around um, um, a topic. I would say voting is, is a great way to kind of say, hey, this is, I think this is important. And as Yaron mentioned in the chat, feel free to vote on, on anything you find 
uh, important. It's not like, uh, you know, you have to just choose one. But I, I also want to encourage you to go in and if there's something that's marked as a proposal, uh, put, put your views on, see how we can make those proposals better. I think the better we are with these issues in the planning stage before we go to implementation, and maybe there's different angles we didn't think about, maybe you're using Dapper in a specific way or have a few scenarios in mind, uh, that's your uh, opportunity to influence. We're really looking for that at this stage. We want to be driven by the scenarios and by the ways people are using Dapper. Now we're at this post version 1.0. A uh, place where people are using this in production we want to be very intentional and mindful of the way we kind of uh, tweak and, and add updates and improvements. So really engagement through GitHub is the way to go. Voting, uh, commenting, and so on. Um, I'm Dar wondering, Arthur, maybe uh, you're on, feel free to jump in here also and yeah, yeah. take as a maintainer. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I just want to chime in and say that, you know, th this voting mechanism is really for the community to let us maintainers um, and and if, if you don't know um, who Arthur and I are, we are maintainers on the Dapper Dapper um, core runtime repository. Um, it's it's a way for us to know what you care about, right? It, it's not like a voting process where we're building Dapper Parliament or something. Um, you know, it's it's just a, a, a way to see where the the community is at. Um, and you know, we, we've taken a lot of community feedback up until now. We just want to solidify it maybe a little more. And this is where the, the, the GitHub voting process um, takes place. Yeah. If there are things that aren't on this list that you'd like to see here, um, that's another way as well. I mean, you know, whether it's put comments inside this planning thing and say, make suggestions there as well. Yeah, that's a great comment. Yeah, if, if you'd like to see something or, you know, you have a pretty good case about why something, you know, must come into this six months plan, um, just feel free to comment here. Well, I would just say maybe open an issue for something and then mention that issue and yes, comment yes. in this, in yes. this uh, plan, yeah. Yes, yes, this, this issue is about, uh, it's to track all the work items. Uh, we don't wanna go deep, yeah, here, yeah, makes sense. And uh, for example, uh, we recently created an issue, sorry, a community member created an issue. And after a lot of discussion going on, you can see 39 comments, um, we put up for vote. So which approach does the community prefer for this particular issue? So there are multiple options here. Uh, and this is small, like a uh, 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 detail on, 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 it's not like a major item, but it's something that we decided, okay, let's try the voting process here too and see where we land. So, uh, so you're going to see more and more of this coming, for, uh, uh, coming up uh, as you open the list of issues. And one thing I'd like you to bring up is for 1.1, we are focusing on bringing Dapper uh, 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 into even a more even even more stable uh, uh, version. So we're going to prioritize fixes or improvements. We're not going to necessarily prioritize major feature additions at this point. Um, 1.2 is going to be the next one. Uh, doesn't mean there won't be new features, but we're not. It's not a priority. And right now we are focusing on each repo has their own milestone uh, prioritized. So you're going to see a slight difference from 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 the last time. So if we want to see what's coming up. On Dapper Dapper or Contrib or CLI, uh, take a look at the milestone. The milestones will be um, the way to go uh, to see what's next. Okay. Yeah, and maybe just to add to that a little bit about the process, as Arthur mentioned, this is a little different maybe than the way we kind of manage things uh, before version 1.0. We had uh, usually a big project on GitHub, so you can see uh, work items as they where they are at, if they're at the to-do list, if they're moving towards uh, in progress, and when they're completed. Uh, honestly, this, uh, this is like a good problem to have, but we, we, Dapper is just big, right? Uh, we got maintainers in each area and repo, like Archer, Men Archer and Yaron are in the core. Uh, uh, Charlie, for example, is like a the Python SDK. I, I do, along with Aaron, uh, maintainers on the docs. So um, this is kind of like a divide and conquer and also letting the maintainers kind of own their area and prioritize it and see what they think is uh, is important and is feasible to get into the next release. So we kind of tweaked it a little bit instead of uh, having one big project with everything. Uh, each repo is going to have a milestone. Uh, and this issue that Arthur is showing right now uh, is kind of a list of all the milestones that are basically going to go into version 1.1. So if you want to know uh, in terms of version 1.1, what's going to go in in the, in the world of Java SDK, you can see that milestone there. And that's where the Java SDK maintainers the, the work of triaging, looking at uh, upvotes, as we said, comments, things that they feel are 
uh, urgent or more important. Um, and and uh, that's what's going to go in. So that's kind of like a way uh, maybe to understand how this uh, looks at uh, looks like. Yeah, Ori, uh, just one more thing. I, I got a, a message in private and I want to make something clear. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean that um, if an issue is brought up to a vote that necessarily the way um, or, you know, the proposal that gets more votes is going to be the one that's chosen. Um, that's not going to happen. Uh, like I said, it's, it's for us as maintainers to know um, where the community is at with regards to the, uh, to the issue or proposal that. Oh, 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 oh. Great point. That, there's maintainer's discretion here, right? That's yeah. the, the way we kind of defined it. And this is just a way to create a signal uh, out of the noise or not to say the noise, but all the chaos that's around and just uh, and let maintainers kind of get more information from the community. Yeah, I, I, I don't want anyone to come and say that, you know, their elections were stolen or something. Yeah, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we're, we're not going to get into that. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, they used to say competing solutions, and then like the difference in voting is minimal. Uh, uh, so, vo so we, we have an idea. Okay, it's it's not such a big difference in preference, you know. So uh, it's not like like a pure voting process. Yeah, I agree. Okay, um, thank you, Arthur, and your own for that. Um, Charlie, I know you have something you want to discuss in the spirit of what we just mentioned. Um, so take it away. Yes, I certainly do. Um, all right, everybody can see that, I assume. Um, yeah, we see your screen. So um, in, in light of what we just said, there's something uh, I wanted to, or, or an issue I wanted to highlight uh, on the community call um, that I think is an excellent candidate for community feedback. Um, this is a community contributed issue. Um, Jason Song, if you're on the call, uh, this is a, a great uh, proposal. Appreciate the level of detail. Um, I'll give you all a quick overview of what is what is here. It's basically a proposal for us to have to, to have a uh, formalized spec of the uh, Dapper API. Um, for the gRPC API, we sort of already have that, like the proto files that we distribute um, with each Dapper version. You could, you could totally take uh, those proto files and the Dapper API and have your own Dapper gRPC server, um, uh, and that's something you could do today. Um, so this proposal covers well. What you know? What about the HTTP API? Um, uh, and the, the use cases could be something like um, I want to have my own Dapper as a service, or I want to have my own Dapper sidecar, or I want to auto generate a Dapper client in a language that isn't uh, supported uh, by gRPC. Um, you know, lots of cool applications there. Um, and the reason I wanted to highlight this is it actually overlaps with um, something that uh, we did internally at a hackathon a, uh, a little while ago, and I'm gonna gonna demo what it looks like. But um, uh, you know, one of the possible tools we might use to deliver this feature uh, would be OpenAPI, uh, also known as as Swagger, um, and um, a uh, uh, let me switch to the demo here. Um, there we go. All right. Um, so uh, a while back in the hackathon, um, I uh, coded up a real quick uh, um, demo of uh, using an open API spec uh, to generate uh, Swagger UI. And that it actually, the way this works is that it, um, is it runs as an app that proxies through um, HTTP or uh, HTTP API requests to the Dapper sidecar. So what this functionally means is um, this, app is a uh, kind of a working uh, Swagger UI 
for Dapper. Um, and so let me I'll switch back to the browser here. Um, and uh, I uh, we we had at least one community contribution of a, a swagger spec for um, for our uh, service invocation API. I also uh, created one for our state store API. Um, and you can see here, uh, the UI provides um, basically uh, the documentation and um, and actually you can actually do a uh, example. Uh, so if I did Uh, if I just uh, modify this state store request and click execute, uh, you can see I got a 204 back saying, yes, your uh, state store was successful. And then, you know, if I go and I can click try it out, do. Um, you know, select a uh consistency model and i don't need any metadata for this one and uh look i get my state store back um so uh so that quick demo just to highlight sort of the power of what um of what having a formalized spec might be able to deliver and i i wanted to show it to you all to um because uh this would be uh, a lot of work. This is not. This is a you know not a not a small sized issue, and so we want to we want to know from you all: is this uh, a thing worth putting our time on the in the next six months? Um, you know, if there's a lot of demand, it might be totally worth it to uh, to spend some time on this. Um, but you know, I think this is cool, uh, but I don't know what you all think. So um, I, uh, uh, I want to, to bring this to your attention. So like we were just saying, uh, go find this issue. If you, uh, if you uh, are, if you think this is something we should do, um, click the, the like button, uh, upvote it. Um, and, uh, you know, and if you want to say, oh, you shouldn't use open API, you should totally use this other tool or whatever else. Like we, that's the kind of feedback we'd love to hear. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so uh, by all means, uh, let us know what you all think. Cool, thank you, Charlie. Can you maybe drop a link to the issue in the chat here just for I, folks who are listening? I certainly can, I will do that right now. And I think there is a question in chat. Oh yeah, so what problems does the Swagger API for Dapper solve? Well, the, the big ones, um, are one it allows uh you to build clients oh i'm glad you asked this because i had another demo to show um uh um it allows us uh to build clients for um so let me share again uh for languages that we don't have yet um right so um one of them is is uh is Lua, right? We don't have a, we don't have a uh, Lua API um, supported. Uh, but if you, if you were to use a, if we were to publish a Swagger spec, uh, you could go and auto-generate a uh, Lua client um, and then use it. I have a, a little, a little uh, Lua script that I, wrote using a generated Lua client here. And um, I can run it real quick and you can see it uh, will, uh, yeah, it stores uh, a key value pair and gets that key value back and then deletes it. Um, and that's all in a language that, uh, you know, we don't we don't have a any, uh, um, supported API for. Um, so the other thing it could allow us to do is it could uh, allow us to support 
the Dapper API in other protocols. Right now we have HTTP one and we have gRPC, um, but you know may, maybe we want to support HTTP two without gRPC, or maybe we want to support Cope or um, you know it, 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 any one of the, the. It opens up a lot of possibilities for us to have uh, a consistent API across uh, languages, implementations, and uh, platforms. Um, and the other thing we can also do is is auto generate our um, documentation, which today is kind of handwritten. Um, so uh, having that auto generated for the spec would be uh, would allow us to you know keep that in sync a lot better. So I'm already seeing a suggestion in the chat for another uh, alternative to Open API. Awesome. Those are the kinds of things I <laughs> want to see. Which is great, and I would love uh, for you, Mr. Jenks, to uh, maybe kind of mention that in the issue itself, so it kind of survives just this call, and um, other people kind of get uh, an idea of this, and maybe can uh, um, chime in. So thank you. If uh, that is all, oh wait, another question: Will this be able to support IPC communication between sidecar and service? Charlie, I believe this is a question for you. Uh, okay. Uh, will this be able to support IPC communication between Sidecar and Service? I'm blanking on on that acronym. <laughs> Somebody, well, well, let me let me. You can unmute now, uh, Lanut, if you want to speak to it. Hey, hello. I was thinking about inter-process communication. Oh yeah, yes. Um, you, are you talking, uh, when you say uh, interpress, so with like a Unix socket, is that what you're talking about? Or? Yes, name pipes, UDS. Um, uh, so we actually, we have a separate uh, proposal. Arthur, is that, uh, is that uh, written up as an issue yet or um, uh, for, for that? But, what, what's that? I think it's mentioned um, in an issue at least. Okay. Um, um, but I, I think that is is separate to the open API spec, but is a thing also that we could uh, conceivably support. Yeah, um, there, there is a, an issue for uh, Unix sockets. Yeah, it's in the plan. And, okay. and then, um, for example, that's that's a no-brainer for using Unix sockets for um, gRPC. So that will be mm -hmm. the first the first approach. And then we might bring to HTTP. Uh, depends on on how the libraries can perform HTTP over uh, Unix sockets. I, I I read that it's not that straightforward, so we're not sure yet about HTTP. Okay. Yeah, I think this Open API is more about standardizing uh, the Dapper API, kind of externally, not so much about uh, the sidecar to app. But right, making making an an API spec that you can consume pro programmatically. Um, yeah. And. Uh, is the kind of the something the, predictable the, and standardized? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, Yaron, I think we are up for your demo right now. If you're ready. All right. Cool. Yep. Thank you. Sec. All right. I will share my screen, and you will let me know when you can see my terminal. I promise I will. We see it. All right, great. So uh, today we're going to see about um, how you can consume Kubernetes events using Dapper. So before we take a look at that, let's just talk about Kubernetes events in general and what they are. So Kubernetes has um, an object model at its base. It has a resource model where you deploy um, a declarative configuration and using Kubernetes declarative APIs, it reconciles the state. Um, between your resources and the, the state that's in the cluster. Um, and all of those resources have um, a bunch of properties that are attached to them. Um, but one of those is the, the concept of events. So any type of resource, when it gets dealt by the Kubernetes um, controllers, or you know, even if you're adding your own custom controller on Kubernetes, um, it might emit events um, for you to, to be able to consume. And so let's just take a look at what those events uh, are and you know what they look like. So I'm just going to be doing a kubectl run, and this is my kubectl command here. I just aliased it, and I'm just going to use it to run um, an nginx container. So 
let's just let this thing run. And we can see that the container is creating. And if we go ahead and describe that pod, uh, we can see that um, there's a bunch of metadata here, you know, the, the scheduling semantics, the controllers, uh, who controlled it, which is the Kubernetes replica set. And in that case, the, the controller for this pod, the replica set um, emitted um, some events and the kubelet, which is the, the part in Kubernetes that actually schedules the container on the node, emitted some other events. And you can see that events have a type. So the type of the event, um, reason, uh, the age, uh, who emitted the event, and a human readable text message. And the reason why you would want to consume those events um, are many. You know, for example, if you're writing a Kubernetes operator, um, those events come in real handy to make decisions. Um, about how your custom resources are behaving in the cluster. Um, you know, it allows you to check up on their status and, and make decisions based on um, the events. It also helps you keep like um, an event source um, log stream that you can view later on and not in real time and analyze, you know, if something went wrong, maybe you want to put an ML model on top of it to, to see if there's any anomalies. Um, maybe, you know, it can um, bring up something that's, you know, inherently wrong in the cluster. And then, you know, also if, if you're just running your regular Kubernetes workload, you're not necessarily writing a Kubernetes operator um, and you, you want to uh, listen to events for uh, the cube system component. So you want to track the cluster health. So you want to get all types of events. Maybe they're related to your deployments. Maybe they're related to your storage units. Um, you basically just want to keep track of those and maybe write them off to storage or um, just, you know, uh, filter in memory and, and take a decision um, based on whenever something happens. So the way to do that would be, you know, for you as a developer, you'd need to go in and pull a Kubernetes SDK. You would basically need to learn about the Kubernetes internals, um, basically to craft that call into the Kubernetes API. And you will need to know about things like informers and watch lists and stuff like that. And the code is, is mostly, um, uh, it's mostly uh, kind of to people who don't know, you know, Kubernetes internals a bit difficult to understand. Um, this is a, a Golang example. Like for Kubernetes events, there aren't many examples in the wild out there about how to consume those events. This is just a Go example. Um, this is actually from the Kubernetes uh, binding for Dapper itself. So you can see here that there's just a bunch of Kubernetes um, Go code that's occurring. Um, and if, if you're a Node or Python or a Rust developer or C++ developer um, and you try and find uh, examples of how to consume Kubernetes events with these languages, um, you'll see that you'll soon be out of luck because there aren't many examples, you know, if at all. Like most of the examples are for the Go SDK. Um, that's just because Go was the first officially supported uh, SDK client for Kubernetes and uh, more are being added, but it'll take time. So, you know, what if we just want to keep our code um, as unopinionated as possible and, and just want to start consuming events? Well, that's where the Kubernetes binding for Dapper comes into place. Um, basically, this is all we have to write, and this is written in Python. So we just have a regular uh, API server here. You see, we have no SDKs, not the Dapper SDK, not um, not the Kubernetes SDK, just Flask, which is the Python web server, and we're listening on a route called events. When we're getting an event, we're just printing out the JSON so that we can see what's going on, and we're returning a 200 OK response because who doesn't like to be OK? Um, and so this is basically all we need. So what do we need to set up uh, in addition to the code to get Dapper to start sending Kubernetes events to us? Uh, so inside of the deployment folder here, um, we have this thing, and this is really all you need to start pumping up events. This is a Dapper component, and it has a type. It's of type bindings.kubernetes. And here we can specify a bunch of metadata. I removed some of the other metadata that you can configure just to keep this uh, simple and short. So basically, we're, we're saying, hey, uh, grab events from um, the default namespace and just send those uh, into my app. And those two other things here are just uh, things I copy pasted from the Dapper docs. Those are Kubernetes RBAC resources that give Dapper the permissions to consume those events here. So that's basically just a copy paste from um, our docs, which by the way, you can find here. If you go to your docs, operations, components, bindings, you'll find the Kubernetes event binding spec 
um, dead simple, like this is the, the binding and this is stuff that you just copy paste to give Dapper the permissions. Um, and so I have um, a YAML file. This is a regular Kubernetes deployment. It's just going to deploy um, the file I have here to Kubernetes and Dapper is going to get injected in the sidecar and let's see what happens. So I'm going to go into the deploy folder and apply everything in here. So it's going to apply my app and the Dapper component. So if we go here to the main view, we will wait until uh, the container is up and running and it already is. And if everything's working correctly, we should um, start seeing events getting pumped in. And here we go. So we're getting a bunch of events and that was, this is the log stream. So we can see Dapper just starting to pump up events from Kubernetes. Um, you know, for example, this is the event that happened when our Python uh, application was scaling up and um, the replica said probably uh, send that one. And you have the namespace, um, the Kubernetes resource type and a bunch of other um, metadata that, that you can use. So, you know, at this point you can just start filling out by whatever events you care about and then persist them or um, take actions based on the types of events. Uh, you know, whether or not you're writing an operator or if you just want to track the health of or status of any of your deployments or on the other Kubernetes resources that you're running in your cluster. So uh, this is it. Again, the docs are right here um, and I am done. I will stop sharing. Very cool. Thank you, Irona. I'm not seeing any questions about this. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay, yeah. Cool, thank you. I think that's pretty useful. Uh, another useful binding from Dapper. I think uh, we can move on to the open discussion section. I know Aaron wanted to uh, to call out something. So Aaron, do you wanna, was something you wanted to mention? Yeah, um, so well, let me share my screen really quick oh. just to give you a quick visual. Um, so uh, just this uh, past week, uh, we, uh, went live with the latest Inside Azure Data Center Architecture talk with Mark Rosinovich. It's a fantastic talk, highly recommend uh, going and checking it out at aka.ms slash data center internals. Um, I'll post that link in the chat here in a second. Um, but the call out here is that Dapper was actually the topic that got the most love out of uh, any other topic in the session. So I think he talked about it for a solid like 10 minutes or so, um, starting out with, uh, like what is Dapper and all of that goodness to um, two separate demos. Uh, we had like Sander and uh, Edwin from the community help out with these. So we dive into just a quick getting started with Dapper. And then we actually uh, Dapperize the eShop on containers application and do a quick overview of that. Um, so shout out to Edwin and Sander helping out there. Um, and then we also have a couple other interviews as well. We interviewed, uh, the uh, Kai Walter from the Zeiss group as well. So there's a really great interview where you can hear about how uh, they re-architected their uh, order distribution uh, application on Dapper. So um, I'll post a link in the chat, but it's aka.ms slash data center internals. And there's a whole, whole bunch of other great uh, topics in this talk as well. 12 demos, two interviews, and a lot of really cool stuff. So that's what I had. Cool, thank you, Aaron. Um, yeah, it's really cool. And, and uh, if you don't know, then we have a case study all written up about uh, Kai's um, um, usage of Dapper or running it in production over in Zeiss. So that's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, I actually have one more topic as well that I want to um, call out. Well, maybe two. Uh, one is that uh, latest addition to the docs. Um, and thank you, Aaron, for doing some of the work here. And, and thank you very much for Alibaba for doing a lot of the work. If you notice, we have a new drop down in the docs. Uh, and now we have Chinese. So uh, some folks from Alibaba are actually working to translate the Dapper docs to Chinese. And that is really exciting, really cool. I can't read this, but I trust it is uh, as informational as our English docs. Uh, we're very excited about this. I actually saw on Discord. Um, uh, note from Patrick. I don't know if he's on the call, but he's actually looking to do this for Korean as well. Uh, that's awesome. 
Uh, if you want to have more guidance on how to do that in your favorite language, uh, we have the contribution docs. And at the bottom, we add a little bit of explanation on how we are adding translations. Uh, we kind of need to maybe add a little bit more information, but feel free to reach out to me and to Aaron on Discord on the documentation channel for more about this. One more shout out uh, is to a recent blog we just had uh, from Nitya, who is a um, developer advocate, uh, cloud advocate at Microsoft. And she created this really cool uh, visual guide to Dapper, uh, which I think is awesome. And she's, uh, she always says she's a visual learner. She does these kind of things. Check it out in the, in the blog. You can actually get a high definition version of this if you want to print it out as a poster or I don't know as a blanket to snuggle with it. I don't know what you, you want to do with this, but um, I love it. I think it's great. Uh, it kind of captures a lot of like the overview in here. Uh, if you're a visual learner, if this is helpful for you, it's cool. I think it's just awesome and kind of some of those characters are kind of cute. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much what I had. I think we're happy to now um, take questions, comments, ish, uh, things you want to discuss in the remaining 15 minutes of the call. Uh, so feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, if you also want to, if it's too much to, to write up and you just want to talk, then let me know. I can let you unmute. So uh, Xavier question. asked if, if, we, um, if we can bring more use cases, uh, which I, I think will be a great idea. Yeah, I think we're working through that. Um, there's a few folks we're in contact with to to get. And Xavier, uh, you you actually <laughs> been a great contributor in that respect uh, with your blog about the way Roadwork uses Dapper. Uh, and um, yeah, we're looking for more of these. There's actually a couple that we're kind of already engaged with to put these into place. So yeah, uh, I don't have anything concrete or date to, to, to share, but we definitely want to bring more of those. I agree with you. That's how we learn more about this. This is also helpful for us as maintainers and uh, for the entire community to see how Dapper, what are the directions that Dapper is taking and what are like the cool new ways that people are using it. But yeah, we're definitely prioritizing this. If anybody on the call is using Dapper uh, in a really cool way and wants to blog about it, or actually if you want to blog about anything, reach out to me, I managed a blog, happy to help you. We actually can get these uh, pretty quickly in. Uh, we had a really good one from uh, a bunch of people on this call actually. Uh, Xavier, as I mentioned, Harry did one for New Relic. Uh, Rob did one for uh, PHP. Archer did one for uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, so yeah, lots of good stuff. We wanna continue uh, providing more good content in the blog. Um, yeah, some ideas there. Uh, Alibaba use cases, other people in their use cases. Yeah, for sure. Uh, agree with that, Xavier. Question from Harry, interested in other languages for the docs. Well, I'll be honest, like um, I, well, I speak English and Hebrew. I'm okay with the English, but um, if there's anything that yes. you feel is missing and, and mostly have the ability to contribute, because that's not something that I think we uh, can take on. So it is something that's going to be like, uh, you know, Alibaba said they'll take on the Chinese uh, stuff and we're more than welcome to help them support it, but they're kind of managing that. Uh, I can't read it, so I can't even like uh, proof it. So, <laughs> so it's kind of up for the community. If there's anything you're willing to kind of step up and um, take ownership of, we'll, we'll definitely welcome it. But for now, I don't think we have a list of languages right now. I don't, I don't know. Uh, maybe that could be an issue on the docs and you can, people can vote on it. And uh, maybe we can find somebody to own it. That's uh, one way to go. I know, Harry, if you had anything in mind. OK. Um, I don't know if you want to help me out here if I missed anything. Um, no, I don't think you did. Okay, so yeah, so with that, I think we might end a little early. Um, so thank you for joining. Uh, this uh, recording will go up on YouTube, hopefully by the end of the day. Um, and uh, yeah, and continue. I think we, we have some really cool stuff coming up as you saw in the planning, check it out uh, in the issues 
as Arthur mentioned, feel free to, to weigh in with votes, with comments, with opening new issues of things you're doing. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the uh, calls to action. Reach out to me uh, if you have any ideas for blogs. I also want to encourage you to go on Discord. Uh, a cool milestone we just reached uh, is a thousand people on Discord, on the Discord server. Uh, a lot of people on the call here today, I know, are more experienced with Dapper. Uh, please help us kind of answer questions. There's some people who, you know, just got the awareness uh, from the announcement and have some, some good questions in there. And I know a lot of people have some really good things they can share. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, oh, here's a question. Is there any communication between the Dapper people and the eShop on containers people? Well, the eShop on containers people, I know I saw Edwin on the call. Uh, there's definitely communication here. I know uh, Mr. Yes. Jenks, if the you answer is, The answer to that question is yes. Yeah, yeah. Example, we, we work closely with them and Edwin uh, yes. is on the call. If you yeah. have any questions right now, Mr. Jenks, I don't know if there's anything you want to comment because we even have Edwin on the call right now. And Yeah, and if there's a particular question on that that you're asking for about wanting to see something in the eShop on containers, yeah, um, yeah feel free to drop me, Mark Fussell, an email or, or Edwin or just post something inside the eShop on containers and on Dapper repo is the best place. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with that, I will, uh, yeah, we'll end the call. So thank you so much for joining uh, and see you next time. Okay.